Uh, well, uh, as you know, today we have the first, uh, the second uh, lecture uh, of the of the school. Uh, it will be uh, Professor Paolo Boldi from the University of the Studio of Milan. Uh, Paolo is uh, the coordinator of the PhD program of computer science and computer uh, and uh, of computer science degree at the university, and he, he works. Uh, in, as a research topic, uh, issues like algorithm, data structure, big data, and many other features of this. Uh, Paolo is a well-known uh, expert of this thing. We have cooperated with Paolo in other areas of our uh, studies, especially on uh, uh, big data, but uh, it's the first time that we invite Paolo to talk to journalists or media practitioner. But I think that in this very moment is really interesting how journalists have to deal with data. So I think it's an extremely timely lecture and we are all happy to have uh, Paolo here. Paolo, please. Uh, thanks a lot, Luigi. Thank you, Marie, for the invitation. It's really nice to be here. Uh, from the very beginning, I should say that if you hear a dog barking, he's, he's my dog. I don't know why he is get, he's getting crazy now. I don't know. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, without further ado, let me start with my slides. Uh, as Pierluigi said, uh, I work at the University of Milan and my main research topic is algorithmics for data analysis. And well, today, uh, what I want to show you is the computer science view on data journalism, if you want. Um, I, I will start trying to tell you what is, uh, in my opinion, the borderline between data science and data journalism. And uh, well, the, the final point for me is that a, data, a good data journalist must, must also be somehow a, a good data scientist, or at least he must understand the data science jargon. In a way, what I, what I will try to do is offering you a jargon, a set of pointers to really relevant topics in data journalism. Uh, of course, I will not have enough time to cover them all, but at least you know that they are there and how they are called. This is sometimes the key point to, to entering um, a, a research area, right? So if you know, for example, what data wrangling is about, even if I don't tell you fully how to, to obtain it, you, you can search it by yourself. You will see examples in, uh, all over my presentation that you can think of as a sort of a uh, guiding uh, uh, set of tools, a set of words to guide yourself through data science. Um, then I will move on to speak about data because of course this is the object we, we need to talk about. Uh, there are many kinds of data and I will offer you a sort of a taxonomy about data and then I will mm, try to uh, give you the, the set of basic tools and the basic phases that uh, data pass through to get to the intended application. And finally, but also along my presentation, I will uh, from time to time mention tools and formats. So let, as, as I said, let me start with, with a brief introduction on data science. Uh, data science can be defined, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, popular topic today. Uh, data science is, can be defined as the set of theories of principles of tools that allow one to study and gather knowledge from data. And uh, beware because Data to me are an opaque object. Data by themselves do not show any information, any informative content. The operation of extracting information, or as I uh, wrote in the slide, knowledge from data is precisely what a data scientist does. He takes data that are opaque and tries to extract information, knowledge, models from the data. Many uh, scholars and many 
academics from especially from the old school uh, often uh, say that data science is nothing but a sexier uh, name for statistics. This is in a way true. Uh, if you look at these two pictures, I don't know if you know any of these two guys. On the left, there is this Mr. Charles Giver that is probably the most famous data analyst alive. He's extremely rich and he works mainly for the financial business. On the right-hand side, Mr. Ronald Fisher, who is one of the founders of statistics. So do they really do different things? Well, um, in a way, they, they use the same tools. And in fact, data science uses many tools for, for, from statistics. I must say this, because I don't think that any data journalist can be a good journalist if he doesn't know about statistics. Even if you want to be a journalist, but not a data scientist yourself, you will in a way always use the results of a data analysis. And in order to understand them, you must know some statistics. Uh, for example, you cannot understand any uh, statistically significant result if you don't know what a p-value is, just to give you an example. So statistics is a basic tool for data science, but also for data journalism. Not that you need to be a statistician yourself, but you need to be acquainted. You need to be familiar with the language of statistics and with the basic tools of statistics. But data science is not only statistics, and that's why data science makes sense by itself. It also borrows from other disciplines, mainly computer science, that's why I'm here, uh, information theory, mathematics in general. And if you hear other words like business analytics, business intelligence, predictive modeling, all these buzzwords are to me essentially synonyms to data science or data analysis. So data science is a very sexy word and also a very sexy job. Uh, the Harvard Business Review in 2011 said that data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. This is very true, but the question is why should it be considered important? Why should it be considered important now? And what does it have to do with, with the pandemic? Um, in general words, as I said, to me, data are an opaque object. But the nice thing about data is that they allow you to extract model of things. So if you observe a phenomenon, for example, the COVID pandemics in Europe, then you have plenty of data. But unless you try to make an effort and extract a model from the data, the data by themselves don't tell you anything. A model is a way in which you try to devise a possible cause-effect uh, relation from the data. Once you have a model, the model can be used to make predictions. And this is the key point of data science because predictions means, mean money, they mean efficiency, they mean uh, if, you, if you're able to make a prediction, they mean it means you have a tool in your hands that allow you to de decide to make politics, to decide what approach is best followed to, to treat the phenomenon under consideration. T clearly, this is very important in the, in the context of uh, COVID pandemics, but it's important in general. In general, trying to devise a model of reality is really valuable. And you can, you can read this in another way. You can think of data as the past and prediction as the future. So what really data analysis is about, is about it is about predicting the future based on the past. Uh, but why is it important now? I mean, this idea that you can extract a model of reality from data is always been there. So why now and why, especially with the pandemic, this has become so important. Um, to me, there are two reasons. Well, one is that today we have much more data than we used to have. Uh, for example, if you go back to the Spanish flu 
in, 1980, uh, in 1918. Of course, it was a pandemic, much like the current pandemics, but the quantity of data that could have been collected at that time is nothing compared to the data we, we today have daily about the COVID pandemics. So this is one of the reason. And the second reason is that today we have much larger comp computation and capabilities than we used to have. The two things need to be together if, because if you have a lot of data but no, not enough computational capability, then the data are useless. And on the, other, on the other hand, having a lot of computational capabilities but no data is as useless. The two things together allow you to study complex phenomena and to train much more complex models. I can, I can try to draw a picture for this. Suppose you have some phenomenon that you want to study. Now, the phenomenon itself has some amount of complexity. Typically, you don't know how complex the phenomenon is, but in a way, there is an intrinsic complexity. And on the other axis, you can see the size of data you have at your disposal. Now, in this, uh, in this graph on the lower triangle, uh, there is the situation where the phenomenon is so complex that you need a lot of data to understand it. So in that area down there, you, don't have, you simply don't have enough data to describe correctly the phenomenon. Now, the rest of the, of the graphics, uh, in the past, we used to live in, in that triangle down there where we could only describe simple phenomena because we had little data and with little data you can only model simple phenomena. Today we, we are in this area rather because we have much more data. The phenomena we can describe are much more complex but we need more complex models to describe them. And by the way, as you move up in the size of data, you need more and more computational power. So this is the story why data today are useful and why they are so important to describe complex phenomena like uh, the COVID pandemics is. Now, you may wonder why I decided to start with data science and not with data journalist right with data journalism right away and the reason is that i think that data journalism is more than data science in fact it's data science plus journalism so it's a mixer of the two things together a data scientist aims at understanding and also exploiting the data whereas Data journalism is, a, is more about explaining or presenting or visualizing the data. But the key point is that you need to understand the data in the first, in the first place, even if you are a data journalist only. Uh, only is, is not a good adverb here, because a data journalist needs to have many tools that are also a data scientist needs. Uh, I think that somebody raised a hand. I don't know what is the protocol to be used in this case, should I go on and wait until the, the question time, or should I stop? Uh, your preference, as you, as you prefer, Paolo. Uh, so maybe if you have an urgent question, I can answer. The person that raised his hands or her hands. I, I will go on anyway. No, so it's, coming. it's coming. It's coming. I just put Amina. Um, I think Emina would like to ask, ask, ask a question and I just um, opened um, her mic so she should be able to. Amina? Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, we cannot hear you anymore. Emina, are you there? Sorry, a minute. We can't. We can't hear you. So maybe it's better if I go on until the end, and then I will. Uh, there will be some time for questions and answers. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the comparison to me is that data journalism, unfortunately for you, requires all the skills of data science, all the possibly to a lesser extent, 
for example, you don't need to be, you are not required to be able to make uh, like a, a data fitting, for example, but you need to understand what data fitting is, or you need to understand what a um, statistical test is. You don't need to do it yourself, but you need to understand its results. This is what I think at least. Um, of course, data journalism often concentrates on visualization, but understanding the data is as important or even more important. It comes before being able to visualize the data. So let me, let me move to the next step. In the, in the first introduction, I, I try to explain that a data journalism need to have more or less the same skills as a, as a data scientist needs. And now let me go to the, the uh, point of data. What are data? So we always talk about data, but for a computer scientist, there are many kinds of data. Uh, in my mind, there is a spectrum of, possi of possibilities. On one extreme of the spectrum, there are what we call structured data. You often think of structured data as tables or sets of tables. Uh, they are called structured because they have a structure, it's quite clear. Uh, structured data are easy uh, to, to handle, they are easy to process. Uh, the structure itself contains a lot of information already. Um, the typical tools that you use to mm, manipulate structured data are databases or the poor man's databases that are Excel tables. Uh, spreadsheet really are not the right tool to use to manipulate this kind of, of data. The right thing would be to use a database, but still you can do many things with, with spreadsheets alone. On the other extreme of this spectrum come the unstructured data. And the typical examples of unstructured data are written text or images or even handwritten text. These are very unstructured. Uh, by this, I mean that they can easily be understood or easily more or less be understood by human beings, but they are certainly not at all uh, amenable at um, automated processing. But, but of course you have to deal with unstructured data. For example, if you want to make some analysis of Twitter about people that tweets about uh, swaps, COVID swaps, for example, you will need to, to look at tweets and tweets are by definition unstructured. So uh, you will have to meet unstructured data at some point. And in the middle between these two extremes come what we call semi-structured data. Uh, there are data with some structure on them, but not a lot of it. Um, there are many, typical formats for unstructured data like JSON or XML. I will get back to this later in my talk. So all forms appear in a typical uh, data analysis campaign. Um, and for many tasks, the first purpose is often trying to reduce them to a structured form. So you start with all these data coming from different sources, all the data come in a different form and they have a different degree of structuredness. And the first step is often to try to reduce them to a very structured form. And I will take this standpoint in the rest of the discussion. So the first effort will be to, to reduce the data that you obtain from many different sources and of many different types into a structured form. Um, now, when, I, when we talk about information or data, we can uh, reason about different levels of granularity. Let me start from what I call atomic information. In the, in the case of COVID, one example of atomic information is uh, the description of a specific COVID patient. This is an atomic information that you typically don't have access to because as a journalist, you don't have access to uh, single patients. But imagine for a moment that you can because this is where the data come from, really. A typical COVID patient will be described by a series of informations like uh, his or her sex, age, uh, 
other data like whether he's a non-smoker or a heavy smoker or light smoker, uh, his or her weight, his or her height, uh, his current state, whether he's in home isolation, whether he's currently hospitalized, whether he's in intensive care, uh, and other things. I mean, I can mention really one million possible single data information about a single patient. And you can think of this as, as a table, right? As a very structured kind of, of data where every row is an item, in our case, a patient, and every column is what we call a feature. For example, sex is a feature or age is a feature or whether the patient is at home or hospitalized or in ICU is all another feature. Now, uh, for, uh, for what concerns features, there are many types of feature, features. Some features are numerical. Uh, numerical can mean discrete, like my age, which is an integer number, or it, they can be continuous, like the hemoglobin, hemoglobin level of my blood in this moment. Or they can be of other forms, like categorical. Uh, sometimes cate categorical means non-numerical. Categorical it can have an, an order, like a smoker can be a non-smoker, a light smoker, or a heavy smoker, or even the state is, is typically an ordinal, right? You can be healthy or uh, at a, in home confinement, or in the hospital, or in ICU. Or sometimes they are just nominal, like sex. There is no order in sex. But it's clear that depending on the type of analysis you want to do, some features are more relevant than others. Uh, now, often you cannot decide which features you, you will have. In, a, in an ideal world, you, you would choose which features you want depending on the type of study you want to do. But typically you cannot decide. You must do what you can based on the, on the features you have. In general, if you can choose, it's better to have more features than less features. Um, but as I said, sometimes you are constrained by the data that you already have or by the cost of extracting or I should say getting some extra features. Uh, sometimes you have to pay for data. This is not something strange to you, I guess. Um, I started from the atomic level, but of course, from the atomic level, you can reach different levels of granularity, right? The individual level is one level of granularity, but then you can reach to a hospital level where you have data about all the patients hospitalized in a given hospital, or you can reach another farther level, which can be, I don't know, region or country. Um, each time you pass from a level of granularity to the next, you do that with a process that is called data aggregation. And data aggregation can happen with different operators. You can sum, you can average, you can count. And these operations uh, coarsen the level of granularity at, at the price of doing an operation that is usually irreversible. Every time you, you, you go up with the coarsening, you lose information. Um, there are many aggregation axes like this, this happens especially in multifaceted uh, data that can be aggregated along different axes. Let me do an example. For example, if you want to answer the question, what is the average age of COVID patients in Italy? The axis of aggregation here is age and the aggregation type is average. Whereas if you want to know what percentage of patients are female, you are trying to aggregate the same data, but along another axis. This time the axis is sex, and the kind of aggregation here is count. Or you can do more complex, complex kind of aggregations, like you want to know what is the average age of COVID patients in the two sexes. So this time you want to aggregate into along two different axes at the same time, age and sex. Um, one more level of complication is that all the data we are looking at evolve with time. So they form what we call a time series. Uh, and this happens at all levels, levels of granularity. 
um, let me let me uh, show a picture that explains what I have in my mind. So if you look at a specific individual, then he, his state evolves in time, right? He gets more heavy, he gets older, and at some point he can get sick, and at some point he can be hospitalized, and then he may recover. Uh, and this is the time series at the level of granularity zero, at the level of individuals. But if you course in the data and look, for example, at a specific hospital, then also the hospital evolves, right? The number of patients increase, increases or decreases, the number of patients in uh, intensive care uh, change in time, etc. And same at every level, like here I drew at the level of Europe, the patients in Europe. So there are these two axes, time and granularity. And the, the, the axis of granularity is in fact very complex because there are many ways to aggregate, many axes. Things are complicated. And another thing that you must keep, keep into account is what is the format of data? Uh, the actual data that you download from somewhere can be downloaded in different ways. They can either be in some human readable form, like data you read on a web page or no, newspapers. They are by definition unstructured because they are not thought uh, to be further processed. They are thought to be read by humans. Uh, Examples of this are text, even when they appear in the form of tables or graphics. Or sometimes they are available in a machine-readable form. They are ready to be processed uh, by either some specific application, like Excel or SQL or whatever, or they can be in a format that is amenable to uh, be, let's say, processed by many different programs. So uh, now that we know what data are, let me tell you what is the conceptual sequence of operations that you do from the beginning, from when you decide to start an analysis to the end of your pipeline. It's, it's like a pipeline that of course starts with finding the data and especially in choosing the data source. Uh, data sources, the places where you find data, uh, can be uh, classified in different ways. For example, based on which data are made available. Mm, for example, there, there are sources where you can find data about patients, other sources that, where you can find data about swaps, places where you can find data about current legislation, uh, about COVID, current COVID legislation and so on. Or uh, you can taxonomize data about the, uh, based on the level of granularity. For example, if we just look at patients, uh, then you may find data about individual cities or, or, or uh, coarser data about countries or coarser data about, I don't know, world regions and so on. You may decide what, which data source you want to use based on the format that the data source provides. And of course, uh, since the data change in time, about how often the data are refreshed or updated. Sometimes the data are simply refreshed. Sometimes the data source keeps track of the snapshots of data in, in a long time. So it's only updated, but not refreshed. Um, one last question, but it, it, which is very important, important is how accessible. Some data sources are more accessible than others. Uh, I mean accessible both in a technical sense and in the sense of how free the access to those data is. What is the non-disclosure agreement you have to sign in order to access that specific data source? Um, and last but not least, how reliable the data source is. Each single point in this, uh, in this list is extremely important. By itself, it will need not, not a full lesson, a full course. How to decide whether a data source is reliable, this by itself is a very important and difficult problem. 
Now, once you have decided your data source, you will have to get the data from the data source. Now, if the data source offers the data in a machine a readable form, there is nothing to do. You just have to download the data, that's it. But if you are trying to get the data from unstructured sources, like, I don't know, Twitter, or from a newspaper that only offers tables that are thought to be used by human beings, but not further processed, you, you, will, do to, you will need to do uh, something that is what we call web scraping typically or web crawling or social media mining depending on the specific type of operation you want to do and on the specific type of for of data source you're looking at these terms web scraping web crawling social media mining all refer to the problem of taking an unstructured data source like Twitter or like a web page or like Facebook or like whatever, something that is not thought to be processed but only thought to be read by human beings and try to extract in an automated way information from that source. You can go one step further sometimes if you want to also mine pictures or multimedia that come from the data source. This gets, this gets even more difficult because it, because it requires something that we call information retrieval. Information retrieval is whatever technique you use to get useful information out of pure, pure text or pictures or uh, multimedia of any kind. All these operations require some effort. Um, for example, if you think of scraping, which is one kind of, of operation you sometimes need, um, this is the process of getting structured or partially structured information from web pages or websites. And uh, even just this specific operation can range from very simple tricks to very sophisticated software packages, depending on, on how sophisticated the kind of extraction you need. For example, uh, if you look at a web page that contains a table and you need the data in that table to, to be important and somehow further processed, uh, you can use simple tricks. I, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with a function that is called import H HTML, which is available in Google Sheets. This, this function allows you to import a full table from a standard web page. It's a very uh, rude form of data scraping. If you need something more sophisticated, you will certainly need some coding experience. So these stages where you download information from unstructured sources is something tedious and it almost always requires some coding experience. Now, once you have the data at home, now, now that you, once you have gathered the data, one thing that you may need is what we call data wrangling. Let me explain what data wrangling is. Sometimes the features you have brought home, you have downloaded in some way and brought home, are too raw to be processed as they are. Suppose, for example, that by uh, magic, you have been able to download the pictures of a bunch of COVID patients. Would that be any useful? Pictures are too raw for any kind of processing. But of course, there are ways to extract elementary features from raw features like this. For example, from a picture, you can extract, uh, you can try to understand the sex of patients or uh, their ethnicity or their hair color, if, if it matters at all in your, in your analysis. This kind of processing that allows you to take a raw feature, a complex feature like a picture or a sound uh, or a piece of text and process it to something um, simpler, then that would help you a lot. Uh, let me do another example. Suppose you have the collection of tweets about I don't know, the, the measures of uh, Italian government about COVID. 
So you have these tweets and you want to know how many of them are negative and how many of them are positive. They are just text, so they are too raw to be processed. But there are many tools available, even free, that allow you to understand if a given tweet or if a given sentence is positive or negative. Um, this is, by the way, called sentiment analysis. Now, you can take a sentiment analyzer to take that very raw feature that is the content of the tweet and extract a simpler feature that is whether that, that comment is positive or negative. This kind of processing is called data wrangling. One other thing that you may need is what we call data fusion. Data fusion is necessary when you have many different sources of similar data. An example can be the following. Suppose you had, the, you had the, been able to collect the data about the patients uh, hospitalized at different hospitals of your city. Sorry, I hope you can hear me because my mic had a problem. Uh, now, you, you, you want to, uh, to merge those data. It's, it's a sort of a union of rows, right? Because you have the data coming from different sources and you want to put them together. Now, the problem with this is that it rarely happens that two different sources are really the same. I mean, they will offer some common feature, but some features will be offered only by some of them. Say, for example, that hospital number one uh, collects also the height in centimeters of his patients, whereas hospital number two does not. Then, if you want to merge them together, you will find yourself with a table where only some entries will have a value in the column height. So you will have to decide what to do. Either, either you delete that column altogether, but by doing so, you lose some information, of course, because you lose the heights of the patients for which you, don't, you know the height, or you may decide to do something else. This, this is called data reconciliation, when you want to reconcile data coming from different sources. Sometimes the reconciliation doesn't have to do with missing features, but with features that are not um, measured in the same way. Suppose you, you, measure, you want to mix together data coming from a hospital in London and data coming from a hospital in Milan and data coming from a hospital in New York. Now the height may be present in all the three data sets, but not all measured in centimeters. So you will have to, in that, in that case, reconciliation is another thing. You need to, to make a conversion uh, of units, right? Another kind of, of merging data is called data integration. This is, this is the opposite, in a way, of data fusion. Because in this case, you have sources giving you information about the same items, items, but different kinds of information. For example, suppose that you have the data about some patients and you want to add to those data the monthly wage of your patient because you want to know if there is a correlation between their state and their monthly wage for some reason, which, which may be well possible, of course. Now, typically, the hospital data don't contain the monthly wage, but you may be able to get that data in, another, in some other way. Then this, this is a different kind of integration, right? Because you are not trying to merge rows, you are trying to merge columns. And to merge columns, you, you need to do some data alignment, as we call it, because you must be sure that the patient on this row is the same as the taxpayer on this row. One further problem is data cleansing. Data cleansing means that the data you have are typically very noisy. They contain a lot of spurious numbers, a lot of numbers that are wrong. And the elimination of this noise is called cleansing. And data cleansing entails a number of possible things that can be the detection of outliers. If, if you find a patient that is 2 meter 50 height, probably that is not a real patient. Probably that datum is wrong. Uh, this would be an outlier or you can identify anomalies of some kind and of course eliminate them. Uh, or you can use redundancy to check for consistency. For example, if you have different sources that give you 
the number of deaths of COVID deaths in a specific country. You may check that they are the same. On if you are, if they are not the same, you may want to try to understand why they are not the same. You may discover by serendipity many interesting things when when you check for consistency of data coming from different sources. Um, one thing that is particularly important for time series and especially important for the COVID pandemics is data smoothing. That is a form of data cleansing. Data smoothing is the, the following problem. Time series are sometimes influenced by single point anomalies. Like let's say today's stop data in Italy are much lower than expected, but this is because there is a late uh, lab that did not uh, make it in time to uh, communicate the data to the ministry. So this is a single point anomaly and uh, you must know where this anomaly comes from and you must be very careful because if you publish the datum itself it will show as a very um, a very small point, whereas the point is not so small, it is comparable to yesterday's point. It's just that there is a datum that is missing there. Or there is another problem that is periodic fluctuations. Uh, for example, it is well known that there, are, there is a weekly pattern in stops, in stop processing, because on weekends, many labs are closed. So if you look at the behavior of stops, you will see this uh, periodic fluctuations. And you don't want to take this into account because this does not tell you the truth about the data. And the, typical, the typical solution to this kind of problem is using moving averages instead of using point, um, point data. Moving averages tend to smooth out those kind of problems. If you look at the same data set, the, the description of the same phenomenon, with or without smoothing, you look at the, the graphs and they are often completely different. And one is true and the other one is false. The true one is the smoothed one. Uh, here, true and false is, are, I mean, you must understand very, very well what, what I mean by true or false. The true nature of phenomena is better explained looking at, looking at smoothed data instead of looking at the raw data. Now, uh, applications. So all these pipelines lead you to some uh, well-grounded, clean, well-structured data. And now comes time for your applications. Now, in data science, the main application is, as I told you, prediction, or even before prediction, building models. Building, model, building models means that you want to understand in a model the cause-effect relations that you can read from your data. And you want to use these relations to foresee the future. Now, machine learning is the standard way to do that. And this is one of the ways in which artificial intelligence comes. This is, of course, out of the scope of a data journalist. The data journalist does not need to build a model, although sometimes he can get a model from data analyst and in that case he will need to understand what the models says or what the models how to use the models let's say to uh, forecast what will be uh, happening in the future but beyond learning data science does a lot mm, of many more things uh, one is data visualization which is of crucial important for uh, uh, importance for a data journalist for a data journalist. And another thing that is strictly related to data visualization is data exploration. That is the way by which looking at data, you can discover by serendipity new things. Uh, another very important point, I, I am uh, citing it because it's of crucial importance for journalists, is the problem of data protection and privacy protection. So let me uh, tell you only about these two applications of data science. Uh, starting from data visualization, I just to give you some examples, I know that there are specific classes about data visualization in, in, this, uh, in this course, so I don't want to indulge too much 
on data visualization, but I just want to offer you some nice examples, I think, of, of data visualization. You can find all of them in a, in a website called Information is Beautiful, and they are all about coronavirus. So this one, for example, is the set of trajectories of the virus in time uh, in different countries. Uh, whereas this is the infection and fatality rates by country. I'm providing these graphs just to, to, to show you how you can convey what you learned from the data once you know what you want to convey. Um, this is an, uh, another very nice example of where, uh, in which countries coronavirus is rising or falling. Um, it, it's very, the, also this picture is very nice and very well, easy to read. This is another, yet another example, but that website contains really the hundreds of examples. Hundreds of examples in general, uh, or thousands, I, wish, uh, I should say, and hundreds about coronavirus by itself. This is a nice picture of the, um, how contagious or dead and deadly at the same time a given um, virus or uh, viral disease is. And COVID is a rectangle down there because we don't know exactly how deadly and how contagious it is. But you can, you can use it to compare with other, with other diseases. Um, let me now come to the last issue that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, the privacy issue. I want to uh, give you an example that is not related to coronavirus immediately, but it's a very good example of how easy it is to inadvertently uh, breach privacy. Um, you may know this example already, but it's all, uh, it's anyway very important uh, for those of you who don't know to, to present it. It's uh, the uh, America Online Search Data Leak. Um, it is related to search engines. Uh, America Online used to be a very popular search engine in the United States in the early 2000s. And uh, in 2006, uh, people at America Online decided to publish a large query log of their user, of some of their users. A query log, in case you don't know what it is, is a, uh, a record of the queries that the users submitted to the search engine. Of course, search, every search engine has this kind of information in their premises, and America Online decided to publish it. Of course, uh, they, they decided to delete usernames when they published the query log. So in their uh, mind, they hoped to uh, had been able to delete all the personal information. But in fact, two very good journalists at New York Times were able from the query log to, lo to, in to locate an individual, uh, a lady called Thelma, uh, Thelma Arnold living in Georgia. What they did was very simple. They took this query log that was made available for researchers to do research about uh, search engines. And uh, they, look, they looked at people making queries. And in particular, they observed that there was a user identified by a number who was looking, uh, was doing a queries like landscapers in Lilburg, Georgia, or looking at uh, names of people with the family name Arnold. And by some very easy deduction, they were able to single out this lady and they contacted the lady and asked her, did you, did you submit these queries to America Online? She was very scared, of course, because she couldn't know that America Online published her queries. This is an, a very good example of how easy it is to do the wrong thing. In the case of America Online, the data set was removed. Two, two, employees, two employees of America Online were fired, but by now the data set had been mirrored by millions of times. And um, now it's not really surprising because, uh, for example, it is known that if you know the zip code, sex, and birth date of a person, you can single out the, uniquely that person. It, only very few information is um, required to be able to single out single individuals. And the take-home message is that 
anonymization usually doesn't work. So be very careful if you are dealing with personal data. Uh, it's true that we as computer scientists try to offer some solutions, but all of them are hardly realizable, implementable on a large scale. And in practice, there is a trade-off between how anonymous the data you are dealing with are made or how useful they become. Of course, aggregation typically makes the problem milder, but still it's something that a journalist must always take into account when he does his job. Now, I, I rapidly come to my conclusions. I know that I am uh, taking too long. Uh, just a mention of the tools you can use for data analysis. Uh, data scientists like to use a tool that is called R. R is very nice in case you are familiar with some programming. Uh, it also offers rich visualization capabilities. You can see some examples if you Google for uh, the R graph gallery. Today, many data analysts uh, decided to move to Python, which is much more general and uh, allows you to a, a larger, a higher uh, form of uh, flexibility. Um, there are also some non-free tools that you can use, like SAS or Stata. Um, but even just the Google Cloud Platform, uh, which is not by itself thought for data analysts, but offers you a lot of and uh, a lot of tools for data analysis and for data visualization. There are similar set of tools made available by other big company, companies like Amazon, etc. And specifically for visualization, which is something you may be interested in, all the uh, platforms that I mentioned offer some form of visualization, but uh, there are some tools that are especially used for visualization. Probably some of them uh, are being presented um, during your visualization classes. Very briefly, uh, I mentioned that there are some many types of data. Uh, there are also many types of formats. Um, the structured data can be represented in many different ways. As I said, like a database dump or an Excel sheet or a spreadsheet, uh, or using the so-called CSV, which is more portable. Semi-structured data often come in one of the three forms, JSON, RDF, and XML. All of them are very easy to read using the tools that I uh, was mentioning. So if you use Python, R, or even the Google Cloud Platform, you will be able to read, any, uh, to read and analyze any of these formats. Um, and in case you, you need to, to do big data, uh, big data are not much different than standard data. The only problem is that you need uh, some ways to analyze them in parallel. But this is probably out of topic for a data journalist. Uh, now, uh, I'm sorry I'm, I'm late, but I am coming to the conclusion. I think that data journalist is of course, very important because social sciences, psychology, sociology are undergoing big changes with the COVID pandemics. And, um, but in general, not only be because of, of the COVID pandemic, but also because data are changing, are shaping the society for better or worse. And the big availability of data allows us to shape a better future if you are able to analyze them properly and if you are able if we are able to convey the results of our analysis in a good way to the big public and i am done i'm sorry for being so late i am ready to take your questions are we still there Oh, yes, so as, yeah, us, we, we, we. <laughs> as usual, um, we will uh, make the attendees all panelists. Uh, someone already has their hand up, I think. I'll just. Yeah, we, we had uh, a, a, a first question from Maya, but Maya is to leave, so she wanted maybe to ask the first question. Okay. Yes, so we all transforming you into panelists for you to be able to activate your video and to unmute yourself and to directly ask questions. 
Should I keep sharing my slides? Uh, because I need them to. If yeah, 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 sure. Thank you for this amazing presentation. Okay. Uh, when um, we did the, um, we choose the presenter for the school, your name was anonymously chosen by the other member of uh, this EMPF. I didn't know why, but now I understand why. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. So we are waiting for questions. Yes. So now they should. Everybody should be able to um, ask question. Is Maya still there? Or? Maybe. Yeah. Go, Maya. Hi. Uh, can Can you hear me? Uh, yes, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for excellent presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I'm just curious uh, with regard to uh, journalism programs in Italy. Uh, not sure if you would be able to um, to answer the question, but what is the situation now? Is this a part of a standard curriculum um, for for journalism uh, courses in Italy or? or not, because as far as I know, uh, in ang Anglo-Saxon tradition, um, data journalism and data science has been a part of a curriculum um, for, for journalism courses. So I just wondered, what's the situation in Italy? Uh, I'm not sure I've, I'm the best person to answer this question, but what I can tell you is that my department, that is a computer science department, is in the last years um, cooperating with many uh, departments of humanistic kinds like, uh, I don't know, preservation of uh, art works or uh, the um, Economia Politica, that is, I, I don't know the, English, the name in English, uh, but we are cooperating on degrees for people that have a mixed background. Probably many of them will end up doing, uh, will end up with a data journalist career, I think. And what we try to present, we as computer scientists, is the basic tools. And I always insist in the fact that being able to, to do some coding is, I think, important. So some basis of statistics and some coding are the key points that can make you, from a standard data journalist, an excellent data journalist, I would say. Because Coding means that you are free to do much more sophisticated kinds of analysis. And statistics means that you don't misunderstand the data. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, there was a question in the, in the chat from Anna. Can you see that? Um, should I, no, should I speak it? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yes, Anna. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I do have a question about like data journalism um, and the fact that it's like this really big trend where um, a lot of newspapers want to have, let's say, visual stories, data visualization stories. But usually the resources of each newsroom are quite small. So normally you don't even have a person who's pretty much good with Excel. It's not something that's taught in the universities. At least I study journalism and we didn't study that. So actually how realistic is that, you know, to, to aim to have those universal journalists who can do, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They can do like basic visualizations. They can do like, let's say basic work with data. Um, is it better, let's say to outsource? I mean, to me, like, I would, I would rather say how realistic is this investment for a newsroom? Is it something that they should, you know, invest and like try really hard to have a data journalist? Is it better to outsource data stories to people? Or is it even better not to have those data stories because in the end of the day, people are not gonna be looking at those visuals. They just wanna read, let's say the conclusion of what this data means. Mm. So uh, my, my opinion is that every newspaper should have not, not many, but at least one good data journalist. And a good data journalist is one that can uh, either do the visual or 
outsource the visual to people that can do it, but understand the meaning. Uh, I think that too often, much too often, data journalism is confused with just visualization. Visualization is a nice part. And uh, I'm, I think that if you do it in a good way, you will attract more readers and readers will understand more easily what's going on. But the first step, even before data visualization, is data understanding. And this is something that uh, I think is more directly related to data journalism. Uh, you can have a very good data uh, paper without any graph, uh, where you just looked at the data and understood what was going on. For this, you will need to make an effort. It doesn't come from free. Uh, for free. It needs an effort of learning. Uh, it's not much learning, but it's, I think it's important. And one more thing, analyzing data without having the capabilities of doing so, without having the basis of statistics can be very dangerous. It can mean that you will misunderstand things and you will publish wrong, I mean, fake news in the purest sense uh, even if you are not willing to, but just because you, you are not able, you were not able to read the data properly. The data, as I said, are always opaque. You need to use some statistical tool to analyze them. And even if you use, if, even if you outsource the analysis, you must understand what the results are. So you need to have some backward knowledge, I think. I'm not sure if I understood you, if I answered your question. Of course, it takes money. I just, I would like to say that in most newsrooms, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, having one data journalist full time, it's a little bit unrealistic. It's, it's quite expensive, yeah. let's say. But he or she can be a freelance, right? She can work as a freelance. And so, I don't know. I'm not a journalist, so I, I'm not sure that I understand how the word of journalism works, but... Can I add something? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm just intervening because if okay. you want to, you. To, to have um, a small view, I'm French, I used to be a journalist, I've never been a data journalist, but in France we have a very good uh, example of data journalist called Data Girl. You should have a look at that. Obviously they're not part of newsrooms, because, as you say, it's very expensive to have a data journalist in newsroom and they take a lot of time. But there's also a lot of collective of data journalists that are outside of newsroom and selling their work as freelance. You will also be able to see that next week with Paul Radu. Paul, Paul Radu is from Romania. He's part of the organization for uh, crime and uh, corruption reporting project. He won a Pulitzer Prize for the Panama Papers and it's actually what they're doing. They're doing data journalism in order to track transnational corruption network. So you will have information on that next week. Obviously it's not part of, the, uh, of uh, a newsroom, but it is a collective of journalists outside of um, of a newsroom. So you will we will talk about that next week. Can I say something, Paul? Of course. Uh, do the true question maybe that they are, they are asking you is how difficult is this to have uh, in a newsroom? or to have an ability to really interpret, understand data. You are, rightly, you are saying you don't need to be a statistician or a data analyst or whatever. You need, however, to understand what you are, uh, the, the, data, the information you are examining. Mm -hmm. But uh, the question is, obviously, journalists are used to you, to information and to analyze information. Now the question is, this information is structured in a different way, comes from different, has to be restructured in another way. Uh, how difficult is this? How, how big an investment can be? I don't, I don't think it's very difficult, honestly. I mean, 
the kind of coding that you need as a journalist is something that we teach uh, to freshmen at our university and it takes like 120 hours. And this is in more than enough. I mean, learning Python requires to a freshman, which means to everybody, 120 hours. And then what else? Then you need a basic course of statistics, like 90 hours. So that's the investment, the quantity of investment. And also we teach statistics to freshmen. But maybe if you, if you want, you need some background in mathematics. So instead of 90, it will be 120. So 120 plus 100 hours. It, I think it's more than reasonable. Can I have one question? Of course. Yeah, it was precisely uh, about that. I know a bit about uh, statistics and qualitative and quantitative data, but I was just going to ask, do you recommend to start uh, with Python and invest exactly this 120 hours? That's a good start point? Definitely. Okay, Definitely. perfect, thank you. And, and choose Python 3, because there are two, py two Pythons. <laughs> but to the, if I would start today, I would start with Python 3. Okay, perfect, thank you. You're welcome. May I ask a question? Of course. Um, hello, Professor Boldi. I'm Roberta Carlini from the CMPF staff and thank you for this very, very interesting presentation. I, um, I am an Italian, I, I'm, um, I'm a journalist as well. And uh, um, uh, I have an, an, a comment on the questions of our students. Uh, um, I think that data are part of the narrative in our society now. So even if you don't want to be a data, a data journalist, you have to build your narrative with data and to do so to understand the data. Maybe this is not a data journalist in a, in a correct sense, in a proper sense, but it is very, very uh, important. The second thing is, is that, uh, of course, the investment of the newsroom may be huge, but not, um, not impossible to do compared to all, all good journalism is very, very expensive. So in this case, it, will, it is an investment in in professional, in, in, uh, in training. But my, this is this has my, my consideration. My, my question is, um, if I am, if you, about your slide on data model predictions. Mm -hmm. If I understood well, the journalist part is on data, collecting data and explaining data. Uh, the shift from data to model, uh, um is um uh, is often based on machine machine learning my question is if and this is maybe not a journalistic problem but a more uh, general problem this um, how do you build a model um, to to uh, want to ask uh, don't you need a theory to be the model or the model is just, uh, um, has to rely just on the machine learning that in some way it's a substitute of uh, a theory? So yes, a, a very good question. So uh, in a way, artificial intelligence bases, is based on the fact that you don't need a theory, that you build a model out of data without any theory. Of course, this is, the model you build can be good or not. Only the future will tell you because you build a model out of the data with machine learning, with artificial intelligence, and then you will use it on, on the future. But maybe uh, the model is completely wrong and then you will it will make uh, wrong predictions. When models are, bu are built out of a theory, they are certainly working if the theory is correct. The, a model coming from data can be correct or not uh, because it is not based on any theory. And one important and difficult thing that people are trying to do now is understanding the theory 
from the model. You see the point? Because you start from the data, you build a model, but you don't know what the model tells you. And now you, you have to explain people what the model says. And this, this part, this is a very important and still misunderstood part of, of artificial intelligence. It's called explainability. You want to explain the model that comes from the data. This is not really understood. And it is very difficult to understand, especially today that we live with those models coming from deep learning. Uh, we know that they work well, but we don't know why. And we don't know what kind of theory they, they are because we, the theory is built by itself. So there are these nice things like you, you build this classifier for uh, pictures of cats and, and dogs. This is the classical example, uh, right? You, you take a bunch of pictures, some of them are dogs, some of them are cats, and you use them to build a classifier. Now you can look at the classifier and try to understand which parts of the pictures he is trying to focus on to understand if that picture is a picture of a cat or, or a dog. And what comes out is, for example, that the model looks at the, the shape of ears. Be, because if they are pointing up, it's a cat, otherwise it's a dog. But it, this is uh, uh, collected a posteriori. You look at the model and try to understand what the model does. It's really tricky. It's not a theory. It's a theory coming from a model, not a model coming from a theory. It's, it's really ridiculous. Oh, well, because we are here discussing uh, uh, journalism, I think, uh, we, and uh, I want to ask you a tougher question about uh, where we stand. As you know, disinformation and fake news is one of the major issues in the discussion, and even our group is involved, uh, uh, the CMPF, we are involved in a major project at the European University Institute that is called EDMO, that is the uh, a project uh, of which one of the elements is uh, uh, to help fight misinformation in Europe. A very complex issue, obviously. How do you, what do you feel about uh, how data, uh, data science, uh, data analysis can help? Can you really think, because somehow we are kind of investing in the idea that the jour good journalists can help fight this information can help fight fake news. But uh, do the journal, what do they need, the journalists, to have uh, the instruments to uh, reach? Uh, how can they really be armed to mm. they first this, start disentangling fake news from true news? I would say that data good data journalists are on the front line uh, in, in the war against fake news because data are their weapon and the fact that they know how to read them is the way they fight. So they can show what is the truth and they can argue that that is the truth because they have the data in their hands and they, the data are witnesses of the fact that that is the truth. Unfortunately, bad data journalists are producers of unintentional fake news themselves. And they look like a normal data journalist because they present data, right? So to, um, to the public, a good data journalist and a bad data journalist, they look alike. They are both presenting data, they are both presenting graphs, and they are both credible. But they, one is reading correctly the data and the other one is misreading them, either intentionally or not. So I think that the kind of fake news that come from social network, they are easy to fight. The kind of fake news that come from bad data journalists or data journalists with bad intentions, which is even worse, uh, these are much harder to, to fight, I guess. Hi, I also have a question um, relating to further training. So you said it's about 120 hours of basic coding and 90 to 120 hours of basic statistics to sort of um, properly educate the journalists who can handle data, at least on some level. Um, what fundamental topics should this course cover? 
And what level of mathematics uh, do you advise candidates have when they start uh, studying basic statistics? So they should have, uh, like, they should know some calculus. Mm -hmm. uh, and not much, not much more. I mean, statistics at the basics is easy. Uh, easy. Well, it needs the kind of, of mathematical background that you have after the high school, after your high schools. So, okay. not, I mean, we teach, in fact, in our curriculum, we teach it after a course about uh, calculus. So you need some calculus for sure, but that's pretty much mm -hmm. it. And for well, coding, well, yeah. Yes. Uh, and for coding, I mean, you can start coding now if you want. I mean, I teach coding to people. That's, that's the topic mm -hmm. I usually teach every morning. And I teach to freshmen that don't have any background, basically. Okay, yeah, and what basic, um, what basic elements should a coding course cover to be well, a good quality course? I would Pardon? say Python. I, I would say, okay, so you can program in whatever language you want, but if I had to choose one as a data journalist, I would say Python, and any good course of Python would be okay. Then after that, once you know the basic coding, uh, I mean, Python is nice because it's a programming language, but it's very popular and it has a lot of packages, libraries with re that are ready to use. So once you know how to, to do the language, it's like learning to swim. So once you have learned to swim, you can swim to whatever island you like. So there are ready packages for visualization, packages for data analysis, even packages for machine learning. And once you know to, how to program, you can use those packages based on examples. All of them come with lots of tutorials and examples. And as you need them, you will use them. Thank you very much for the lecture and for answering my question. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I, I have a, just a quick question for you is uh, because yesterday I went to the opening conference of the Association of Internet Researcher and Jacob Lina Jensen from Dan, who is a professor at the University of Copenhagen, said that we shouldn't be using the term data, but we should be using the term kata because it's not given, but it's something that we take in a special form. What do you think about that? I know it's not directly related to our topic, but I've been thinking about that since yesterday. So what, I want to... What word does he want us to use? Kata. Instead of using data from the Latin datum, so he want uh, to go from the Latin captum as something that we check instead of something that is given to us. No, I see the point. Yes, I see the point. It, it's true. It's true. Uh, I don't know because, well, you, you mean that the data is, is not something that we, we can produce, but we must steal them in, in a way, right? Steal them to yeah. somebody. Yes. It's, it's very true. It is very true. Yes, okay. I, I agree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. Um, just so before everyone leaves, um, we, we, can, we will also upload a lot of um, resources that that you can use to learn about data journalism on your own, if you like, um, to the to the platform, to the learning platform. And uh, following this lecture, I'll, I'll also send you uh, and you all an email with the links for um, Thursday's class with Attila Batofi, uh, which will be on data visualization. So. I think he will also discuss about how, you know where to find data and and he has a number of tools that he wants us to use and download before the class on Thursday so um, you can that that information is already in the platform but I'll send the, the email to you anyway um, thank you is there anything else uh, yes yes and so next week we are inviting uh, general, investigative journalist Paul Radu. Paul Radu is, um, in fact, really related to the uh, session that we had today because he will show how 
is e and and is network of journalists uh they are using data journalism in order to track corruption pattern and to do investigative journalists so you will have in fact a concrete explanation and illustration of what you can do with data journalism uh with generally with uh, with concrete example made by these journalists so i'm um, i'm done okay well paula thanks uh, thank you oh, it was thank a very you. interesting lecture and uh, obviously for all of us is uh there is uh some a need to think how much we can invest on this, but I'm afraid that if we don't invest in that, uh, in that uh, understanding, uh, journalism is, will have a very hard time. Thanks, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.